Louis Flaris and John Kamen are presenting today's fantastic topic of bye-bye vocational apportionment. And I think we should just get right into it. So we're going to start with introductions and Louis is going to start us off. Thanks, Tammy. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Louis Laris. I'm an equity partner with Bradford and Barthel. I have been with the firm uh, almost 23 years and uh, it's been a wonderful uh, ride uh, thus far. Uh, I'm stationed or based in the uh, the Fresno uh, uh, office, uh, covering Bakersfield and and uh, sometimes Stockton. Um, I also head up the appellate division uh, for the firm, and started uh, that uh, shortly after my involvement uh, with Don uh, Barthel and the uh, Almarez Guzman or the Guzman portion of the Almarez Guzman uh, case. Uh, I've handled uh, countless uh, petitions for reconsideration and petitions for removal. Uh, as well as uh, petitions for writ of review. Um, I've argued before the various district courts of appeal and including the uh, Supreme Court. So I'll be bringing some of that experience uh, to bear uh, on today's topics. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, John. Thank you, Lewis, and thank you everybody for tuning in, to, in today. Uh, my name is John Kamen, and I'm a partner in Bradford and Barthel's Woodland Hills office. Um, I'm also director of the firm's editorial board, which is a fancy way of saying that I run the firm's blog. If you have any uh, uh, blog ideas or any questions, common questions, or just unusual stuff come up, uh, feel free to ask me or ask our team, because um, often that stuff turns into our better blog, blog articles. Because if you, our client, you know, has a question that keeps on popping up or something unusual, chances are there's a hundred other claims adjusters out there who actually have the same question. And so that's why that kind of stuff uh, often does turn into better blog articles. So if you do have any, uh, any ideas like that, send them on over. Our best ideas come from you. And I can attest that uh, Lewis has been doing great appellate work uh, because back before I joined Bradford and Barthel, I first met Lewis and Tammy and Don by covering the Almarez Guzman cases. And so I used to uh, bother Lewis, Tammy, and Don uh, on deadline and say, hey, I got a 4 p.m. deadline. Uh, give me some quotes. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, thank you for being helpful. And uh, as far as a bit of background about myself, um, I was a journalist in Arizona and worked for some newspapers there and then came over to WorkComp Central. Um, and I was the legal editor at WorkComp Central for about six years. Uh, I'll finish my intro with one fun fact, uh, which some of you may or may not know. Uh, there is a proposal to shut the 90 freeway. And for those of you who don't know uh, which one that is, that's the one that takes you right to the Marina Del Rey board. So there is a proposal to shut down uh, that freeway and turn it into a park with bike paths. And the rationale between shutting down that freeway and turning it into this big park is that it doesn't have enough traffic jams. So therefore it's not necessary. Uh, so everyone who I've talked to who goes to that board is freaked out by that. And if you uh, want to oppose that, feel free. Uh, I think everyone who goes to that board is going to join you in your uh, opposition to that project. And with that, uh, let's get started, okay? So here's what we're going to cover today. Uh, the NBank decision from the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board in the case of Nunez versus DMV. And so we're going to take a look at what types of cases this decision applies to. We'll brief the case itself uh, as far as facts, history, you know, the rules, and the appeals board analysis. Um, and then we'll also apply it to work comp going forward. Lewis has an updated uh, case on that as well that he's going to talk about. That actually came out shortly after the Nunez decision and builds on it. And then at the end, we will uh, talk about some other recent case law uh, developments as well. So Nunez versus DMV is an M-Bank decision from the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board, or NBank, if you want to say it that way. And what that means is that all the commissioners of the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board signed on onto this decision. And another uh, fun fact about M-Bank decisions is that it is citable authority. It is controlling authority. And that differs from the panel decisions that you hear about all the time. The reason why is that panel decisions are just persuasive authority. So if you have a panel decision that says X, I have a panel decision that says Y, they're equal in weight and neither one controls. Um, and so NBank would outweigh both panel decisions. So just a little bit of background 
as often people like to talk about panel decisions as if they are the rule of law, they are not necessarily uh, authoritative or uh, the pure stage of the law. So too long, didn't read. What does Nunez say? It says that VR experts can't do that. They cannot do vocational apportionment, which is different than medical apportionment. This decision also says that VR experts have to carefully consider medical experts' apportionment factors. So if your QME talked about a factor that went into their apportionment, your VR experts have to talk about that too. So what types of situations does uh, Nunez apply to? It applies to a smaller subset of all the workers' compensation cases out there. And this subset is your higher value cases. As you may have seen in one of our question and answers early on here, uh, it generally applies to cases in the life pension and near the PTD range, or permanent total disability range. And so the types of cases it applies to are cases where you have an AME or a QME finding medical apportionment of PD to a prior date of injury, reducing the PD value. Uh, that apportionment is often to a well-known prior specific date of injury that either settled via an award or CNR, or maybe uh, went to trial and resulted in a findings and award. And that apportionment reduces the monetary PD value of the more recent date of injury. Often that apportionment or reduction in PD value is the difference between 100% PTD versus a lower percentage like 90%, uh, 80%, et cetera. Often that difference can mean a five or six figure difference in dollars, uh, especially if there's no permanent total disability in play after applying that apportionment. So in other words, uh, this applies in cases where there's a lot of money at stake. Uh, so now medical apportionment has reduced PD. And so you have the smaller subset includes, includes cases where your applicant's attorney is unhappy with the PD apportionment given by the med legal experts. So they hire a voc rehab expert. And the applicant's attorney's expert says, existing PD under the rating schedule is inadequate to fully compensate the applicant for their ability to compete in the open labor market. It's not enough. It doesn't do them justice for their injury. They need to be PTD, not 90%. That apportionment should be thrown out. That's what the applicant's attorney's uh, VR expert is arguing in this subset of cases. And so this next slide kind of reiterates that. They're saying that, you know, we should ignore the med legal experts apportionment to that prior DOI. And they'll either reduce the QME's apportionment, which thus increases PD, or they'll just throw the apportionment in the trash altogether and replace it with their own apportionment, known as vocational apportionment. Uh, next, often us defendants will go ahead and get our voc rehab expert who will disagree. So once you have the situation where the applicant's attorney's voc rehab expert has thrown the uh, apportionment in the trash or reduced it dramatically, uh, that begs the question, can these VR experts actually ignore medical evidence from med legal experts? After all, these VR experts aren't doctors, but now suddenly they're playing doctor. Uh, why do they get to play med legal expert when they don't have medical training or a degree, a uh, medical degree that is? And isn't ignoring prior injuries and apportionment actually creating an inaccurate factual or medical history? So those are some questions that we defendants are gonna raise when we see that situation. And there lies the rub, uh, to quote Hamlet and 100 movies after, uh, in the 400, 500 years since Hamlet. <laughs> so anyway, there's starting to be a line of cases that said, that, hey, vocational apportionment is okay. In fact, our very own Greg uh, Fletcher summarized it in an August 2022 blog uh, talking about this scary new concept, vocational apportionment, uh, where these VR experts were throwing out the apportionment to prior dates of injury uh, found by QMEs and AMEs. And that case that Greg touched on was followed up by other cases actually, saying that vocational apportionment was okay. Um, when we published that blog article, uh, you know, none of us liked the case that Greg was talking about it, but you know, Greg wrote that article and we published that blog so you would know about that case, throwing out the apportionment to prior dates of injury. Uh, that being said, we were hoping that applicants' attorneys weren't going to read that blog 
and maybe not find out about it. But obviously word was getting around as there were starting to be more and more cases saying that vocational apportionment was okay. And just like that, this wonderful en banc decision comes along saying that vocational experts cannot do that. So how did we get there in Nunez? What are the facts of this case? Applicant has a specific and a CT, and the QME says impairments or PD for the neck, left upper extremity, and carpal tunnel. The neck has apportionment of 40% to pre-existing factors, and carpal tunnel has apportionment of 60% to non-industrial diabetes. Uh, as we stated earlier, applicant attorney does not like the QME, so they get a VR expert. Their VR expert says, sure enough, cannot compete in the open labor market. The inability to compete has nothing to do with that non-industrial apportionment to diabetes and pre-existing factors. The non-industrial apportionment has zero impact on earning capacity. In other words, the QME's apportionment, that's a different topic than earning capacity is what the VR expert's saying here. And applicant's VR expert says applicant is permanent in total, 100%. And then the QME comes back around and agrees with applicant's attorney's expert uh, that applicant is 100% uh, PD. Meanwhile, the defense VR expert says, says that applicant is not PTD and that the defendant's uh, VR expert is saying that the vocational apportionment to non-industrial factors is at least 10%. So now we're bringing it back down from 100% to 90% of that neighborhood. So now we get to the issues and kind of the procedural nature of the case. So the parties have this disagreement over whether applicant is PTD or not. They go to trial. At trial, the issues are PD, apportionment, applicant attorney fees, and whether the applicant's attorney has rebutted the AMA guides uh, to get applicant to permanent total disability. The trial judge rules that applicant is 100%. They are a PTD. Defendant files a petition for recon. And now the case goes to the appeals board. So here's what defendant argued in their recon. They argued that the trial judge impermissibly disregarded the QME's apportionment to non-industrial factors. In other words, the judge cannot ignore the med legal experts who found this apportionment. Um, they also argued Apkins attorney did not rebut the AMA guides and that the judge should issue a new award uh, based on the QME's reporting. Apkins attorney uh, files an answer, which by the way, you should always file an answer anytime anyone files a petition for recon. I've heard the commissioners say that a hundred times, and also their staff attorneys will say that. So here, applicant's attorney does their job. They do file an answer, and they say, silly defendant, PTD is based on a complete loss of earning capacity, and a complete loss of earning capacity is not based on medical impairment. Obviously, as defendants, we disagree with that, but that's what they're arguing. Applicant's attorney also argues that apportionment of PD is inappropriate in cases where there is a complete loss of learning capacity. And that defendant's voc rehab expert was speculative and based on an incorrect legal theory, which is kind of rich when you consider that the applicant's attorney's expert is also using an incorrect uh, factual or med legal theory by ignoring the med legal experts in the case. Anyway, it, the parties have those uh, briefs go up to the appeals board and the commissioners is issue their ruling that medical apportionment is required by labor code 4663. The labor code makes no provision for vocational apportionment. It's not in the black and white statute, therefore it doesn't exist. Vocational experts can still be used to address issues relevant to PD though. So applicants attorneys can still use them to push back on PD ratings and such. Other elements of the ruling is that VR experts do have to address the medical apportionment brought up by QMEs, AMEs, and med legal experts. Uh, the VR experts cannot substitute valid medical apportionment with vocational apportionment. In other words, if your QME did a good job of identifying apportionment and justifying it, because as defendants, it is our burden of proof to prove apportionment, so if our QME did satisfy the burden and he did a good job or she did a good job, those VR experts can't just ignore that and throw it to the side. And the commissioners in their ruling, they cite cases where you have the prior award situation, where for example, you have a specific uh, that 
is 10 years before the most recent date of injury, which we're currently fighting about. So they cite cases with prior awards um, uh, as a basis for that apportionment in this Nunez decision. They also point out uh, that ignoring apportionment to, pr to a prior injury is inconsistent with what our lawmakers said when they crafted SEMP Bill 899 in 2005. And as you may recall, SB 899 uh, really firmly created uh, apportionment statutes and cemented those into stone. And so just ignoring that, it's not something you can do. It's at odds with what our lawmakers all agreed on. And uh, all this is fitting because many of, the, of these cases where this fact pattern arose did have a prior award, stipulated award, or some kind of uh, obvious uh, pre-existing workers' compensation case where there was PD. Uh, the commissioners go on to explain in their decision that VR reports uh, that do ignore well-established facts and rely on facts that are not uh, germane or are not substantial medical evidence, uh, those, those VR expert reports are problematic. And those are not going, uh, basically you can't do that. You can't ignore well-established facts such as a prior date of injury that clearly existed. Um, and you can't start citing facts that just aren't relevant in a way to get around the QME. And that's something that these uh, VR experts were doing, is they were trying to circumvent the QMEs by citing, well, this little fact here. Yeah, that QME didn't talk about that. Therefore, their entire uh, apportionment finding is not relevant. And so the uh, commissioners, they unpack that. And they give an example. Uh, so for example, one VR expert tried to nitpick the QMEs by saying, well, the prior date of injury didn't require work restrictions. And the QME didn't talk about that. Therefore, the QME's apportionment is invalid. Now, that complaint is kind of a, it's just not relevant when one considers that there's a prior injury that everyone agrees on that exists, and it clearly caused PD to the same body part. And that's required to be considered under the apportionment statutes in Escobedo. So, is that the end of the story? Uh, yes, actually it is. And the reason why is Nunez is going to stay, goodbye. It did not get appealed up to the Fifth District Court of Appeal. That deadline flew on August 6th, and there was no appeal filed to the Fifth DCA. So that is the end of the Nunez case. It stops right there. And that means that this un unbanked de decision is not going to be next by a higher appellate court. And let me kick it over to Lewis uh, for our next slide here. Well, to, to quote Paul Harvey, uh, John, uh, and, and now the rest of the story. <laughs> so, so after Nunez, uh, after the in-bank decision came down, the, uh, the applicant, who is now newly aggrieved, uh, actually filed a petition for reconsideration, which we sometimes refer to um, as a recon of the recon. And uh, the board, of course, slapped uh, that decision down because uh, it, it, of course, went back to the same uh, seven commissioners uh, who issued another in-bank decision, and they um, basically upheld their prior decision, uh, which just from an appellate perspective, uh, filing a recon of the recon is hardly ever successful, uh, which is why it's probably almost always best to simply forego that step, even though you can uh, avail yourself of that step, and to file a petition for writ of review. Uh, that denial of uh, the applicant's petition for reconsideration uh, occurred on August 28th or 29th, I think it was. Uh, so we're still within the 45-day the window where the uh, applicant could file a petition for writ of review. Um, it, 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 there's 15 days left, basically. Uh, but as John said, uh, the likelihood of them uh, doing so, or the applicant uh, doing so, is probably pretty slim. Uh, so I think we will see, and even if they do, I don't think the the, the court would necessarily uh, undo uh, or reverse the board's interpretation uh, of Nunez uh, or of the, of, the, of the labor code and and doing away with vocational apportionment. Uh, so I think Nunez is here to stay uh, for for the time being until there's another legislative overhaul, <laughs> perhaps. Uh, but so I'm going to focus on the takeaways and some of the implications and then the fallout of this decision. And as John mentioned, uh, we'll see uh, actually shortly after Nunez came down. Um, or Nunez 1, I guess you can say, 
uh, came down. Uh, there was another panel decision that the WCAB issued uh, citing to Nunez, and we'll kind of see uh, what the fallout is uh, based on that case as well. Uh, so one of the takeaways, uh, I, I went to a, a, a high school that was very heavy into computer sciences, and one of the first acronyms we learned uh, was GIGO, uh, which stands for garbage in, garbage out. Uh, and that's the same thing uh, with regard to your vocational reporting. Uh, your vocational reporting is only as good as your medical, the underlying medical evidence. So it's incumbent upon uh, you or, or the, the defense attorney uh, or any attorney uh, to ensure that the, the medical evidence that the vocational expert is relying on or reviewing uh, is uh, compliant with all of the legal requirements, especially when it comes to apportionment if you're on the defense side. Uh, so make sure that your expert has the, the most accurate history of those prior injuries, that they've reviewed records, if they're available, um, and that they have a complete uh, uh, physical examination and an accurate history. Um, and then make sure that they weave those uh, details into their analysis. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that analysis uh, entails uh, in the next slide, John. Uh, so as part of that, uh, make sure your doctor carefully and clearly explains uh, why the apportionment to any pre-existing uh, non-industrial or industrial injury uh, is important. Uh, and to, to quote Escobedo, uh, the preeminent case on, on apportionment under 4663, uh, make sure the doctor explains the, the how and the why of that apportionment. Uh, in other words, how is the uh, pre-existing injury or disability or pathology uh, contributing to the current level of uh, disability or permanent disability? And then have your doctor explain uh, how those uh, impacted or impact the uh, injured workers' activities of daily living um, and any sort of work restrictions that may have uh, uh, come about because of those, uh, because of that pre existing pathology. And, and that's key because, as we'll see in a minute, the, the, for, for applicants, the, the takeaway here is well, if you have multiple body parts involved and you only have apportionment to maybe one or two of the multitude or multitude of body parts. Uh, then the uh, applicant may get the uh, vocational expert to focus on those body parts that don't have any non-industrial apportionment uh, to try and find or craft a uh, perm total disability argument. And so that's why it's very important to have your doctor or your medical expert uh, explain uh, exactly uh, how the impairments uh, translate to, um, or to put them in the context of activities of, of daily living uh, and, and work restrictions. And, and that way you can parse out um, or hopefully cut off uh, any, any attempt by the applicant uh, to um, focus in on body parts that uh, have no uh, industrial apportionment or non-industrial apportionment. Sorry. Uh, next slide. So sometimes, uh, 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 one uh, so, so we do have an audience member who asked a good question. Uh, does it apply to all dates of injury? And I do believe that this, well, A, this applies to at least any and all date of injuries after Senate Bill 899. But that being said, I believe that it would apply to all dates of injury anyway, uh, because the apportionment statutes do apply uh, to older dates of injury. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I would. Um, and to, to add to that, it, it, you can still rebut um, uh, a permanent disability rating, even though I still disagree with that analysis. Uh, but they they go out of their way in Nunez uh, to throw a bone to the the VR expert industry and and say that you can still rebut um, uh, the the rating by showing a lack of amenability to uh, vocational retraining. So if, if that could be done you know, prior to 1105, then it certainly can be done post 1105. 
there may be an argument still that maybe under 4660.1 and then the new schedule because there is no reference to a loss of earning capacity um, that that vocational expert opinion or reporting shouldn't apply but I, I think the board has kind of already addressed that in a, in a panel decision um, uh, so I, I think it applies regardless uh, or Nunez applies regardless of date of injury um, thanks Sean so um, in terms of going to your, uh, or how to utilize your vocational expert, uh, I, I like experts who will look at every single uh, comment that the, the medical evidence has to make with regard to activities of daily living and, uh, and work restrictions. And, they will use that again to build an analysis uh, that is hopefully substantial evidence uh, and and uh, takes into account the apportionment. Uh, and again, the, the the board isn't doesn't give a whole lot of guidance. They, while saying that that vocational experts still have to take into account medical apportionment, they they don't really give a lot of guidance on on how a vocational expert is supposed to do that. Uh, so I think if you have a, a case where you have valid, and that's the, I think the key word here from, from Nunez with regard to apportionment, if you have valid medical apportionment, a, a, a vocational expert opinion can't simply disregard that. They have to comment on it and they have to include that in their assessment uh, and, and, and address why or why not um, that apportionment uh, affects the uh, amenability to uh, retraining or vo vocational retraining. Uh, but many of the the experts I use, uh, they will also comment on the uh, the flaws and the errors, uh, any inconsistencies in the opposing uh, sides' uh, analysis. Uh, I, I like them to focus primarily on that aspect, though, of uh, how and why the uh, uh, other side's expert has failed to uh, address uh, apportionment in particular, um, in addition to a host of other things like uh, transferable skills analysis, uh, work restrictions. Um, and sometimes you'll see experts also on, on the other side, especially uh, cross the boundary into uh, and, and kind of, I, I think this was kind of the case in Nunez as well, but vocational experts will sometimes cross the, the line between being a vocational expert and, and uh, into uh, medical opinion. Uh, I, I have seen cases where vocational experts will uh, comment on the applicant's use of medications where the medical evidence really has no comment on what impact the, the use of medication has on their ability to, to function in the workplace. And vocational experts on the other side will sometimes uh, glom onto that uh, data or that uh, uh, history of, of medication use, and they will make a, a full-blown uh, analysis of how they can't work because of that medication. So if the medical re evidence doesn't support that, uh, you, you kind of feed that to your expert and have the expert uh, point that out as well in their report uh, to create a solid rebuttal of that other side's uh, opinion. Next slide. Uh, so uh, some additional takeaways, um, applicant attorneys will, can and still uh, uh, will uh, rebut or try to rebut uh, the permanent disability rating schedule. Guzman is still good law uh, for, for better or worse. Uh, defendants, however, should be uh, cautious or, or wary of a, a strong fact-based argument, kind of like the, the uh, medication usage argument uh, that the, the applicant cannot return to work because of that. Uh, but for the for the defense in particular, though, uh, get a strong and solid rebuttal report. Uh, go to uh, an expert uh, that you trust, that you know. Um, if you need to ever bounce any ideas uh, off of, uh, uh, you know, or get a second opinion on another vocational expert, uh, I'm I'm and I'm sure John as well uh, are happy to uh, uh, comment and give you some additional insight into those experts. Uh, I do try to keep track of, of uh, reports as they come in, uh, and if if I'm if it's an expert I'm not familiar with, there's always Lexis, a legal database, 
And you'd be surprised uh, if you just type in the expert's name, uh, how many cases turn up sometimes. And a lot of those times, I, I've been surprised where the vast majority of the cases that I'm looking at uh, are uh, cases or instances where the vocational expert's opinion has been found not to be substantial evidence. Uh, so I will keep that um, in my uh, arsenal uh, when trying to uh, decide whether to go forward to trial on that, uh, on that case. John, another question? Uh, yes, Lewis. Uh, so we do have some people asking about names of experts, but that kind of raises one issue. Um, there's an expert I like to use in Orange County, and while she's very good with uh, going to scheduling in-person interviews, uh, you know, it kind of has to be in person. She's not going to do it if it's not in person. And, you know, I, that being said, would you agree that there's some kind of geographic limitation to your VR experts or are the ones that you like, are they willing to fly across the state? Because in my experience, it is kind of limited by geography. Yeah, I've seen it go both ways. Um, I have seen um, applicants attorneys here in the Valley uh, solicit applicants attorneys on the Central Coast and they'll come in. Um, and of course, they're happy to bill for travel time. Um, I've argued against that when it's come time to dispute the, the reasonableness of the bills. Uh, that's a whole nother, we could do a whole nother presentation on, on uh, uh, reasonableness of VOC expert uh, charges, I suppose. Uh, but uh, yeah, it, it all depends on the willingness of, of the experts. And of course, if you're trying to bring in um, or send an applicant to an expert that's in another part of the state, uh, you may get an objection from applicant's attorney as to uh, travel. Um, and of course, there is the additional expense of, of travel and, and um, uh, the risks of, of injury, perhaps, um, uh, while traveling en route to uh, uh, long distances to a vocational expert uh, evaluation. Um, a good question. Thank you. Um, next slide. I think I'm done with that one. So every once in a while, you'll see an applicant's attorney, and, and thankfully this is rare, uh, where they will uh, object to you sending uh, the reports of QMEs obtained in prior cases uh, to your medical expert. Uh, that, that is just, it, it's a ridiculous argument. It runs contrary to uh, the last 18 years or so of, of case law. Um, Escobedo, at least one of the logical extensions of Escobedo, is that if you have a, uh, uh, a prior industrial injury and you've got evidence of uh, impairment, uh, due to that prior injury, uh, then that is certainly relevant and, and certainly something that should be reviewed by your uh, expert uh, in order to ensure that the defense can meet their burden of proof. So you've got a, a, a evidentiary argument, a due process argument uh, to uh, rebut such uh, uh, claims by, by applicant's attorney uh, when it comes to what evidence your expert uh, should review. Uh, next slide. So I think I alluded to this before. In cases, um, so in light of Nunez, I think we'll see a shift in strategy uh, on the applicant side. Uh, the the especially in cases where you have multiple uh, body parts or multiple systems involved, and and maybe uh, apportionment to only some of those. Uh, so the the strategy it goes something like this. Well, if uh, have to have their VOC expert uh, focus solely on the uh, body parts that have no non-industrial apportionment. Uh, and if they can get the VOC expert to say that the uh, prior or that the uh, injuries or the body parts without uh, uh, apportionment are the sole cause of the uh, perm total disability or the increase uh, above what the, the scheduled rating is, uh, then that may be enough uh, for them to meet their burden of proof uh, to establish uh, a basis for perm total disability. Um, so again, it, it's incumbent to rebut that, um, to, to get your medical expert uh, to parse out all of the body parts, uh, the impairment, uh, especially if there isn't impairment for some of those body parts uh, that have or that that lack any apportionment, uh, and to parse out the work restrictions due to those body parts. 
So the VOC expert has uh, a clearly delineated record of uh, what all the moving parts are uh, in terms of, of assessing apportionment and the cause of, of any additional uh, uh, or lack of amenability for vocational retraining. Next slide. So the case I referenced um, just came down, I think it was in, in August, I wanna say, uh, or July, um, and it's Gunno versus Best Buy. And they, they referenced the, the Nunez uh, case uh, by name. Uh, factually, we had an, an applicant in this case who suffers an injury on uh, 5513, a very old injury, uh, uh, involving uh, her head, neck, back, and, and psyche. And the, they go to an AME, their first mistake probably, uh, but thankfully this AME uh, finds apportionment uh, to the lumbar spine at least uh, of 33%. Uh, next slide. And the uh, VOC expert uh, tries to sidestep that, uh, this is applicant's uh, VOC expert, mind you, uh, the defense, for whatever reason, or at least the record isn't very clear, but it sounds like the defense did not get a VOC uh, uh, expert of their own at that, at least um, uh, at, at this point in time, uh, which brings up another good point. Uh, get your rebuttal report. Uh, if the other side gets an expert, get one of your own. I, as, as, as much as I love to cross-examine and depose uh, VOC experts on the other side, uh, I'm not a VOC expert. Uh, myself. And so get a rebuttal report uh, to conduct the same type of testing and see if they come up with the same results or different results um, to to build your rebuttal case. Uh, but anyways, um, so the VOC expert, the applicant's VOC expert here, uh, focused primarily on the psychological disability, which had no uh, apportionment, mind you. And, but nevertheless, the uh, expert relied on uh, the applicants or the, the AME's comments uh, with regard to the applicant's complaints of pain and, and factor that into the analysis of, of uh, uh, amenability for retraining and, and basically said that uh, they're, they're permanently totally disabled because for psychological reasons but also because of the, uh, the residual pain this person was experiencing. And so the, um, in the analysis of apportionment, the VOC expert completely ignored uh, the AME's comments with regard to the lumbar spine. And the, um, uh, the judge finds uh, permanent total disability, uh, the defense appeals, of course, and uh, the WCAB reverses and remanded for, uh, so they don't, they reverse, but they don't give a, uh, uh, an opinion or a, a revised award of their own. Uh, they remanded for further proceedings uh, consistent with Nunes and uh, direct the parties to uh, uh, address the um, uh, vocational apportionment or the lack thereof um, and consider the medical apportionment, which was really the, the, the voc experts glaring error in this case. Next slide. Uh, so the likely outcome here, and we don't know, um, uh, what the outcome uh, will be or, or has been, uh, as it hasn't gone back to trial yet, as far as I know. But we can probably expect the the applicant to go back to their VOC uh, expert and try and get that expert to uh, parse out or, or uh, omit any further mention of uh, uh, pain factors, uh, especially with regard to the low back, because there's obviously apportionment there uh, to non-industrial factors. And uh, to focus solely on the psych or some of the other, or maybe a combination of the psych and the other body parts that may contribute to uh, making her permanent totally disabled. Um, so uh, as I mentioned before, there, there was no indication in the record that the defense had an expert. Uh, so hopefully the defense in this instance uh, on remand um, uh, would go back and, and uh, or go out and get an expert of their own as well to try and rebut that and to consider the uh, lumbar apportionment as well. Uh, next slide. And that takes us to the end of our talk about Nunez. I would say we do have some good questions from the audience about Nunez. And one point you uh, touched on, so one good question, um, what if applicant's expert ignores the medical apportionment? 
Is it best to stay silent and then argue not substantial evidence or cross-examine, but then you're kind of helping them give a perfect report? And I think the answer uh, that you were touching on, Lewis, is to, is to get your own expert, have them poke a million holes in the applicant's attorney's report, right? Yeah, I think um, I would probably lean in favor of staying silent um, myself and, and, and say that for trial. I, I, but I, I think having your own expert comment on that as well is, is invaluable. Um, the, um, th there's a chance if you go to trial um, on re that the, the judge will either side with the defendant um, or um, uh, there's also a chance that if applicant appeals that decision, uh, that they could remand because there's there's kind of a period of time after a, a new and bank decision uh, comes down uh, where they are a little more uh, the judges and, and and especially the commissioners at the WCAB are a little more willing to to give you some leeway or give the parties leeway uh, to ensure that their reporting complies with the requirements. Uh, I have already written to experts in other cases of my own, uh, asking them to ensure that their report is compliant with, with uh, Nunez. Um, and I've had applicants to say, well, I've, I, I've done enough. Uh, I'm not going to do that at all. So, you know, caveat emptor, uh, <laughs> buyer beware. Um, uh, there, there comes a point in time where the board is going to say enough is enough. And uh, you, as, a, as an experienced practitioner, you should know what your uh, what constitutes or doesn't constitute substantial evidence. Um, so you do take a risk um, in, in failing to uh, ensure that your reports are compliant with the, with the law. Also, uh, someone else had a question about what makes a VR expert. And what I would immediately bring up is that um, when we defendants get our own VR expert to rebut applicant's attorney's expert, have asked them to look at the qualifications of applicant's attorney's expert, and if there's any room to criticize there. If they don't have the adequate training, that's something that our experts should be pointing out um, in paragraph uh, one through three of their, uh, of their uh, uh, analysis of their report. Yeah, or ask for their CV in advance as well. That's another way to um, vet your own experts. Um, you know, most of the experts we see are the same ones over and over. I don't see a whole lot of that's a really good question. I don't see a whole lot of new ones going into the business, um, which may not bode well in the long term. Um, but um, uh, yeah, most of them are known quantities if you if you ask an attorney. Um, so if if you do have, a, like I said before, if you ever have a question about an expert, uh, don't hesitate to to reach out and and uh, get a second opinion from us. Okay, uh, let's move on. Uh, we will address uh, some of the other questions. Um, uh, after today's presentation as well. We did want to get to these other uh, cases though, as there were two uh, relatively recent noteworthy decisions. Uh, the first one is in regard to employers owing a duty to protect non-employees from COVID, in other words, take home COVID cases. And the other is in regard to grant and study practice. So let's start with the COVID one. Uh, that's Kusiemba versus Victory Woodworks. And this is a state Supreme Court decision that answers two questions about the state of law in California. And those questions were, uh, does the derivative injury doctrine bar a spouse's claim against the employer for COVID-19? Uh, so for instance, if an employee gets COVID-19 at work and they take it home to their spouse, does the derivative injury doctrine bar the spouse's claim against the employer? And by claim, I mean, uh, wrongful death suit or uh, civil suit, personal injury suit, that kind of thing. Um, the second question was, under California law, does an employer owe a duty of care to that spouse or to other household members living in the employee's household? And does that duty, is that duty to prevent the spread of COVID-19? And here the high court ruled that no, the derivative injury doctrine does not bar a employee from bringing them lawsuit for wrongful death of a family member or spouse. Um, but that being said, employers do not owe a duty of care to non-employees to stop the spread of COVID-19. In other words, you can bring the suit, but you will not win it uh, because the employer does not owe that spouse a duty of care. And so again, they had the right to bring the suit in the first place, but they cannot win because they would need to prove that the employer A, owed a duty 
to a family member or a spouse and that the employer thus violated that duty. No duty, the employer prevails. Now, the reason why this is important is before this case, uh, the Seize Candy uh, case had a ruling from the High Court, from the State Supreme Court, that a employee could bring such a suit. And as such, employers were concerned about other wrongful death suits, derivative and derivative injury suits for COVID. And circling back to work comp, how did that affect us in work comp? Well, us on the ground level at work comp, let's say you have a hypothetical TPA uh, or carrier, they accept a COVID claim. Well, they may unknowingly be creating evidence that a party could potentially use against the employer for a wrongful death suit down the road. Now, thanks to this decision, that wrongful death suit down the road uh, is gone. Now, there's less pressure on TPAs and carriers uh, on, on decisions involving COVID claim. And uh, Lewis, uh, did you have any thoughts about Kusiemba and its application here? Um, yeah, I think this is one of those rare instances where the court uh, got into uh, the sort of societal impact um, weighed heavily in their analysis. And that this, yeah, if they had ruled otherwise, uh, this would have opened the floodgates or the floodgates of, of litigation, uh, would have sunk the, the comp industry uh, potentially. Uh, with with a, with the number of claims, um, obviously this uh, might not have applied just to uh, COVID claims going forward. It could have been uh, uh, stretched and expanded to include other types of derivative uh, injuries as well. So uh, it was it, it was I, I think nice to see that they um, uh, considered that factor uh, in their analysis. Yeah, and. Um... As the old saying goes, if you're arguing public policy, you've probably lost already. Uh, this is the one case where the where the state Supreme Court was like, ah, public policy, we cannot do that. Uh, so <laughs> very, very rare that you will ever see them do that. But one in a thousand cases do uh, have public policy considerations, which are the basis of the opinion. Uh, so yeah, very interesting to see them do that here, like you said, Lewis. Uh, moving on to the other important decision that we were talking about, uh, the Granton study. And so this also involves high exposure cases, uh, actually, at the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board. Um, and so this one's called Early versus WCAB. And in this one, the Second District Court of Appeal had ruled that the Workers' Compensation Appeals Board cannot issue a vague decision granting reconsideration, but saying, hey, we need more time to review and then taking two or three more years to review it before issuing a decision on recon. And this applies to about, it's actually unknown the number of cases. It's estimated to be between 500 and 800 cases. Um, but there have been cases where they did this, they granted someone's petition for recon and then effectively put the recon on the hold for several years while they, while they take a, a deep dive into the case. And the problem with that is that you have applicants and defendants uh, waiting for years for a decision, sometimes on the entire case in chief, sometimes it's on a expensive issue or two, and it really holds up the case. Um, so it's basically in injecting a two or three year delay into the middle of the case. And so the fine print of this decision, the appellate court tried to appease both sides by specifying what the appeals board can do under the statutes. And so, as Lewis uh, had explained in our blog article about this, this was kind of a pyrrhic victory, because on one hand, you have the appeals board, uh, and or sorry, you have the appellate court saying that, well, the appeals board can grant reconsideration and then issue a decision on the merits after reconsideration. So it kind of still lets them do that, is my understanding. Would you agree with that, Lewis? Yeah, um, the it, it really just I think will result in a change. Although I haven't seen it yet, I'll comment on more on that in a minute. But it, it, I would expect it to result in really a change of, of formatting in terms of what the board does initially when they get a petition for reconsideration that they're going to take additional time to study. And I think John was very being very kind to the commissioners by saying that they do a deep dive. I, I personally think it just sits on a shelf and collects dust <laughs> for, for a period of time. Um, but the, um, 
so so it, it's really I think semantics. They're saying that you can't review and or grant for review and study, uh, but you can grant and then take your time to issue a decision. Uh, but you need to do X, Y, and Z, or the, the commissioners need to do X, Y, and Z uh, before, as part of that process, explaining uh, what evidence they're looking at and and why uh, reconsideration has been granted, uh, but not to reach a final uh, outcome. Um, and I would also point out that the, the 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 board obviously is not without a sense of humor. This case is called early, uh, dealing with with, <laughs> with procrastination and delay. Um, but uh, the we, we aren't we are not seeing um, a lot of change in the board's practice since the early decision uh, came down uh, on the ground and in the in the decisions I've seen uh, where the board has granted reconsideration they are still granting for further study um, and really showing no indication of complying with the uh, with the board's. Um, or sorry, the, the, the second DCA's uh, opinion in early. Uh, so we, we may see some further litigation um, in that regard. Uh, I have uh, talked to clients um, in my own personal appellate practice uh, about filing a petition for writ of mandate uh, where the board has granted a review for further study. Uh, so there, there may be some more fallout uh, from this and more refining of the decision. Uh, as time goes on. Thank you, Lewis. And you know, we do have one other piece of news uh, going back to the COVID topic. Well, it's a little bit different than um, the facts of Kusiemba. Uh, one thing we did realize is the legislature was coming down to the wire. Um, so uh, let's see about uh, S September 15th was the last day for lawmakers to send their bills to Governor Newsom. And there was no bill that we were able to locate that would extend the COVID presumptions into 2024. Well, what does that mean? That means that if there is nothing to extend them into 2024, the COVID presumptions that were originally brought up in Senate Bill 1159, and later extended into this year, are going to sunset at the end of this year. So in other words, your outbreak presumption and the employer reporting, your first responder presumption, and the 30-day decision time frame in that, the 45 decision time frame and the outbreak presumption, all that goes out the window on 1124. And so I know we have a million employers out there who are gonna be really happy that they don't have to track down all the COVID cases and send it to you, the TPA or the carrier, or um, and I know of many adjusters who are going to be very happy about not having to do outbreak analyses it's often very confusing trying to find, wait, did this person have any 14-day window before, after, or in the middle somewhere uh, where that, that would create an outbreak? So again, um, it appears that there's, there's nothing. I did check this uh, with people outside of BNB as well. They didn't find it either. Uh, these are people who watch the legislature as well. And I did my own searches of the of the bills database and I couldn't find anything either. Um, so that is kind of a, a lurking piece of news that's actually pretty big because it affects every employer in the state. And Lewis, um, for our audience who's not familiar, uh, for your COVID claim, which does not have a presumption, so it becomes a normal claim, uh, what's the applicant's burden in that case? It's the same burden that we that they have for all uh, injuries, um, and that's really um, a preponderance of the evidence, um, uh, and showing by substantial evidence uh, that the injury um, or that the uh, the work uh, was the cause of of that of that injury or that infection. Absolutely, and you know, I, I, one thing I don't see changing is these presumption statutes do talk about the type of uh, test needed. Uh, they talk about PCR tests uh, being needed as opposed to the antigen test. So therefore, I still think you're going to need positive tests in order for them to satisfy their burden of proof in 2024 and going forward. And I think the argument still exists that, hey, we need a positive uh, PCR test um, versus just a picture of a test on someone's kitchen counter because you don't know who took that, you know. Um, you don't know if they're 
their eight-year-old who came home from third grade took that uh, after being exposed to COVID at school and that kind of thing. So uh, it does create many of, or and I guess where I'm going is many of the defenses will still apply in 2024, but we'll have more time uh, and decision, longer decision timeframes, the 90-day decision timeframe to decide those. And with that, um, if we did not answer any of your uh, questions today, we will try to take a crack at them um, after today's presentation. And Tammy, uh, do you have any uh, end notes for our audience here? I do. Thank you guys so very much. And thank you all for the wonderful questions that you submitted. Um, I just have a couple of very quick things. I'll just take a second here. Certificates for CE and MCLE will be emailed to you this afternoon. I will include a copy of the PowerPoint because I know some of you were unable to locate it. So I will include that. Our next live webinar is on October 24th at noon on Keep on Trucking, the latest on illness, accidents, AI in the transportation and trucking division. Again, that is part two. So if you missed part one in August, uh, the video is on our training page. Uh, for B&B attorneys, the video is also on our internal MCLE page. Thank you all so much again for joining us. We really appreciate it. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your week. Take care, everybody. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week.